before we even get swept away into Advent, I want to remind us that, that Advent is a season for spiritual transformation. It is a season where we might meet God again, where, where we might meet God with us. You see what I did there. The work of Advent, it actually started way before Jesus ever arrived, before there was ever anyone to celebrate or, or, or kids to sing songs about, before there were ever the carols that we know, before the, there, there were the hymns that we cherish, before there were traditions and then obligations, before there was tinsel, before there was Mariah Carey, before there were twinkle lights. Advent actually started with God. Advent starts with God, and then God gave the gift, the gift, to God's people, and he called it waiting. It started deep, then, in the souls of God's beloved people, in the deep darkness of their being. People began to notice their longing. They began to notice their desires for something rich and beautiful and perfect and whole. And it's in these deep places that God was stirring. It was God who initiated the longing. Initiated the dissatisfaction with a fractured world and a fractured being. It was God who initiated that. And then it was God who initiated hope. And so, of course, of course, it would be God who would follow through on the promise, the capital P promise. Our name for that promise is Messiah. God would follow through. Today is the first day in Advent. It wasn't December 1st. Your chocolate Advent calendars may tell you that, but it's just not true. Today, uh, we mark it on a Sunday. This is a season of waiting for the coming of Jesus again. The people long ago waited for the Messiah, for Jesus to come. And right now we are still waiting for Jesus to come again. We live between two Advents. And particularly in this phase of the Advent, I want us to soak in the reality of it. We aren't just commemorating the waiting of the people in the Old Testament, the the people of God who God called Israel. These people who were were chronically oppressed and frequently exiled. It is important to note that this Israel that we sing about and that we talk about is very different than the modern day uh, nation state of Israel. And given the things that are going on literally with Israel, it is important for us to differentiate the two. That when the Bible talks about Israel, they're talking about the people of God. That God made promises with, with Abraham all the way along. Not the current government, uh, the current state of Israel. Though they are connected, they're not synonymous. All right, we in Advent uh, can just simply want to rely on uh, the experiences of the people of God thousands and thousands of years ago. But their longing, their waiting, their hope is a guide to us. Because we are right now waiting for Jesus, who did come and who promised to come again. So as a Newport family, this Advent season, we are exploring the truth of God with us, Emmanuel, which is what Emmanuel means. And we're considering uh, the names and titles that Jesus was given way before his arrival in the prophecies over 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. And to reflect on these names Uh, we may be given a word or maybe an image or maybe a prompting for our own waiting and what it means for us as we wait. So the truth of it is we are waiting for Messiah. I think it's helpful to define that, that word because we, you may read it all the time when you read your Bible and think, oh, yes, okay, there it is. 
But in giving definition, the hope is that you might receive it and apply it in your life. All right? So Messiah is a, it's a Hebrew word, uh, and, and it means anointed one. I know, uh, kings would be, uh, or before they became kings, uh, they would be anointed. Oil on the head is what anointed means. Uh, and that would be a sign to that person and, and to all the people that soon enough, this person would become king. It's not quite yet, but soon enough they would be king. Messiah in Hebrew. When translated in Greek, it's Christos, Christ. Both mean the exact same thing. And so this anointed one, this person that bears a a spiritual marking for their later rule is the Messiah. And this tradition, this maybe even uh, ancient sacrament, uh, the prophet Samuel did with the little boy David, anointed his head with oil. And you may hear rings of the story that, that Jesus came as the promised king of David. Jesus in the line of David, there's this connection for the story of God and for the people of God between Jesus and David. But the people, when David was anointed, they were looking for someone who could lead them and help them prosper. They wanted someone who would help them participate in their liberation and and to free them from everything that oppressed them. And then the people heard in Isaiah about someone who might do the same thing. And so in light of what we know about about Jesus, we can see the shimmers of Jesus' character here, the son of David. We also know that the fullness of the Messiah was far different from their very limited expectations of what this Messiah would be. The fullness of Jesus as Messiah is far more than our limited expectations of Jesus in this advent, not that one, in this one. And so we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, and these words might be quite familiar to you, uh, but I simply want you to, to listen, not just with your ears, oh yes, I hear this every Christmas. I don't want you to just lean on nostalgia's sake with these words, but I want you to turn your soul to hear them. And so would you hear these words from Isaiah chapter 9? We're going to read verses 7 through, uh, no, 1 through 7, excuse me. Isaiah says this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And a little sip for me. That would be a gift. We are familiar with the dark, like Pastor Scott said. We encounter it every uh, 24 hours. Did you know that? 
We encounter it in the rhythm of the seasonal year here, the, the big dark, as it's called, in the Pacific Northwest. And many of us are very familiar with dark nights of the soul. Trying to find your way through the dark is a very difficult task. The kids know it. They really do. And you've been in a dark room, and you've tried to find the light switch, right? And you've got your arms out like this, you know, and you're feeling all around for some source of light uh, because you don't want to feel lost in that room, but you also don't want to feel afraid in that room. And you think if you could just find the light switch, you'll have a little bit of hope. Yeah, right? So your arms are out like this. And there's a great likelihood, as you're going like this in the dark, um, that you are going to stub a toe. Or that your shin is going to end up on something, and then certain words might come out of your mouth. <clears throat> Finding our way in the dark is very difficult until we find the light switch and turn it on. The prophet Isaiah promises a light for those people who are fumbling in the dark. He gives a picture then of what this light might be, a picture. He gives a promise of what this person, the, the Messiah, would be and what this Messiah would do. But he doesn't give the whole picture. He doesn't even give all the, the light. The light hasn't come yet. What we get here in Isaiah and what we get throughout the prophecies of the Old Testament are a glimpse. We get a, a portion it's like we get the very first setting on a book light, you know, that's just like very dim so that you can read in the dark without really reading in, in the light. Isaiah is speaking to a people that are very desperate to hear words. They are desperate for the full light. And he's not giving it to them. He's giving them a portion, just a little bit, just enough to kindle courage as they wait, just enough so that they might hold on a little bit longer. And Isaiah's prophecies and all the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament are really truly just a window, a window into who the Messiah was to be. They weren't the totality of who the Messiah was. And, and as we read them now, we might think, oh, this is it. This is all that the Messiah is. But I actually want to invite us to consider that these prophecies, these windows, are a prompt. They're an invitation into relationship. Would you mind if we had a little congregational participation this morning? Okay, really simply, by a show of hands, who has their ID on them? Who has their ID on them? All right. Now, is there anyone who's willing to take out their ID and to come up here for just a moment? Anyone? Benton, would you come up here? Can I use this microphone? Thank you. Benton, would you take out your ID? Can I hold it for a second? Please. Okay, okay. I have in my hands Benson Melbourne's ID, okay? And there are a lot of things that I could find out about you with this ID. I'm not going to name them all, okay? That's fine. Okay, okay. I can find out what Benton looked like at some point at the DMV uh, in a very unflattering photo for any of us, though it really does look like you. I'm impressed. Thank you. There you go. I can know Benton's signature. <clears throat> That's not a signature, yeah. Dude, what is that? should have been a doctor. That's hilarious. Uh, you'll have to ask Benton uh, uh, ben to see his um, uh, uh, signature in a little bit. I can find out uh, whether or not he's an organ donor. That's nice. I can know where you, your birth date. I can know where you live. I can know a lot of things about you. Yeah. Do I know everything about you because of this? No. I don't know much about Benton's life. I don't know much about his family. I don't know about the things that make you joyful, about the things that hurt you the things that might make you afraid. I don't know about how the holidays feel for you by looking at this. I know that you live in Washington. I know that you live in Bellevue. I know that you're an organ donor. Thank you for this. You're if I were a, fr no, no, don't go. Okay. If, I were, if I were a little creepy, um, I could 
because now I know his address, I could show up at his doorstep and, and I could knock on your door and I could say, hey, let's, let me get to know you a little bit more. I could also go onto the internet and find out things about you if I wanted to. Couldn't I? I'm not going to do that. I promise. I really do promise. <laughs> there are ways in which I could figure out who you are and what you're about, but I'm not going to learn it from your ID. Uh, we should get coffee. I'm not going to show up at your doorstep, but at some point I should, we should get coffee and do okay. that. You can take a seat. Okay. Thank you for your ID. When we read scripture, when we read any portion of scripture, it may be easy for us uh, to just assume that that's the totality of who we are getting connected with, that this is the fullness. But the point of scripture and the point of Isaiah's words is to give us a window, a, an ID tag, to invite us into further relationship with Jesus. We might be able then to locate Jesus. We might be able to notice some characteristics about Jesus. Oh, I recognize Jesus from this thing I read in Isaiah, just like I could recognize Benton from his picture on his driver's license. But we can never get to fully know the person of Jesus by these ID tags. Scripture and these prophecies give us a window. And the fullness of our hope in Jesus is not simply found in these truthful but, but limited illuminations of the person of Jesus here. The original hearers of this good news had to, had to make then a million assumptions, a lot of assumptions about who this Messiah was. And we too, in our own waiting, we make assumptions about this Jesus. You see, back then there was a deep yearning for political and social freedom. And Isaiah promised that it would come. And so the people started making assumptions about that Messiah that, that, that were simply, um, that the, the Messiah would simply be a political force. That the Messiah would, would bring uh, social justice to the world for them. And, and they assumed that it meant that there would be military strength behind that justice. That, that the Messiah would be a conqueror. That the Messiah would take over and, and do things uh, and, and exert power in that way. They longed for a judicious government to rule them, and so they wanted a Messiah to do that for them. Those assumptions were birthed out of a hope for their longing to be free. And who could blame them? Who wouldn't want someone to resolve their afflictions and to, to ease their burdens caused by very poor government and oppression? But the Messiah didn't just come to free them politically. Jesus came for liberation at its fullness. Liberation found in an abiding and transforming relationship. This Messiah with us is very interested in meeting us in the dark and bringing us to the light. This Messiah with us would be found bringing shalom to our conflicts. This Messiah with us would bring abundance where there is loss, joy where there is despair, presence where there is emptiness, wholeness where there are fractures and divisions. And all these things would take place in ways that those who hope would not expect. We too have expectations in our waiting. And God wants to meet those expectations, but to also exceed those expectations. We may simply want resolution in our lives, but God with us wants to bring shalom. We may hunger for satisfaction, but God with us causes us to be truthful with our needs. We may simply ache for health, but God with us brings resurrection. And so the question that's been mulling around in my brain is, what will we do in this round of waiting? 
Could these windows into the person of Jesus be a real invitation for you and for me to be curious about what God wants to reveal to us about God's nature and character? What if we found space in our souls to bear what God wants to birth in us? What if we read scripture anew this time of year, wondering what God is doing through and beyond these words to cultivate a relationship with us? It would be very easy to just hear these things again. Oh, yes, I heard this last year. And never open our souls to God at all. And so I want to invite you to take up a few practices, or one practice, in this Advent season. I'm going to offer you two questions and then some, some suggestions. Two questions that may guide you toward a practice. First, where do I experience longing? Where do I experience longing? And the second question is this. It's a question to God. Is there something you, God, want to bring about in me that I am not aware of yet? Let me repeat that. Is there something you, God, want to bring about in me that I am not aware of yet? There are a few ways that we can do this. One is by reading scripture, certainly. Uh, Pastor Ruby put together an Advent devotional for our church that she created it specifically for Newport, for our students, but then also uh, uh, for our whole church. And so I invite you, it's linked at the next at Newport, engage with that. See what God is saying to you. She also created a, a playlist of songs that might be a gift to you, some that are familiar, some that are new, that you might get a different window into the person of Jesus. I wonder for you if it's lighting a candle at home every morning. I wonder if it's eating a certain thing every day. Could it be that you choose to go on a walk or move your body in a different way this Advent season? Something that might open up the window of your soul to receive God. As I close our time, I want to offer you an adaptation of Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, a prayer for us as we enter into this season. Right to the depths of us, something is being given. Messiah will shoulder the responsibility for our transformation personally and corporately. We will call him wisdom up close, strength and power without end, Shalom embodied. Nothing could extinguish or diminish who he is or what he does. He will transform us and the world by forming a new community in wholeness and completeness. Everything working the way that it should. This happens with us and within us because God is that good. So God, we pray, and we open ourselves up to you. You have permission to stir within us desire and hope this Advent. You have permission to uncover our dissatisfactions. You have permission to be near us as we uncover and discover something of your nature that speaks to the depths of our longing. Would you be gracious to us as we go? In Jesus' name, amen.